Welcome everyone. I know we've got a couple more people logging on here right now. Uh, I did start recording the session, so for those of you who may be um, joining us a little bit later, have no fear, we will have it recorded. Uh, I wanted to thank everyone for joining our Davenport Dialogue series. My name is Whitney and I'm the Director of Alumni and Donor Engagement along with my teammate Eric Bain. Uh, we will be helping Shelly host our Davenport Dialogues today. Um, I'd like to take a moment to introduce Shelly Lowe, who's the Director of Career Services here at Davenport University. Shelly and her team have assisted over 200 DU alumni through some of the services that she'll be talking about today, and we're excited to have her join us. I do want to go over a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, we are really excited to have this be an engaging opportunity, so please feel free to ask any questions that you have. You'll notice there's a little purple box in the bottom right hand corner of this presentation. If you open that up and click on the chat bubble, you're able to submit any questions that you might have. Feel free to ask them as Shelly is presenting. I will take the opportunity to pause throughout to have her um, answer some of those questions. We also have a little Q&A session at the very end. Um, Shelly, welcome and we're excited to have you and please fill us in on how we can take charge of our professional growth. Hi and thank you everybody. I appreciate being here today um, and you'll have to excuse me. My cursor has a mind of its own today and I've been trying to fix that but um, I wanted to share with you some important tips on how to advance your career and for some of you maybe how to restart or reignite your career. Um, the way that the pandemic has happened, I know some people have found themselves on an island where they aren't currently in their previous role and they're trying to determine what to do in their next role. So I want to address those questions too if you have them. Um, but these tips and tricks in this slide deck and what I'll be talking about are really relevant to all of you, to anybody who's in a current role and wants to advance in the organization that they're in, and to anybody who is in a current role who wants to perhaps leap to a different industry or is not in a role and wants to leap to another industry or stay in the same industry but with a different type of organization or a different area in an organization. So I'm going to try to cover all of that and try to give you the insights that you will need to build that foundation of preparedness as you go out into the world and into the next thing that you want to do and how to position yourself to get people advocating and for you and looking for you. So let's get started with the um, first bullet point on our agenda for today. We're going to cover the five keys of taking charge of your own success. We're going to talk about resume tips that will help you in those five keys and then help you be prepared for opportunity when it comes. And then also talking a little bit about interviewing today, because as we all know, sitting here on this webinar, interviewing has changed substantially. Um, so let's just get started. So, of course, the number one piece of taking in charge of your career and taking in charge of career advancement is communication. One of the things that we don't often do or that we don't think to do is to share our goals openly and honestly with our current supervisor, with our peers, with other department supervisors that our department collaborate with, with our friends and our family outside of the organization, with our peers that are in industry groups that we belong to. If we are not talking about where we see ourselves, where we want to be, and how we want to get there, or what we see for ourselves in the future, everyone else is going to assume that we're happy where we are, which we might be, but, it's, but they're going to assume this is the step that's our last. They're not going to assume that we're aspiring out there for more. And we'll talk a little bit as we go through these five points about how to do that. But if you're not advocating for yourself, if you're not sharing your goals, you're leaving out an important piece of the growth strategy, which is to let people know 
that you expect to grow, that you aspire to grow, that you want to grow, that you see more for yourself than where you are today. And that's very important. And as we talk about the other four things, you'll see how it all kind of comes together. Um, asking for feedback. What do I need to do to prepare for that assistant director job, that associate director job, that director job, that manager job, that supervisor role, that leadership role, that department head position? What do I need to do? What do I need to go know? Where am I weak? How can I get prepared because that's something I would want to do. So I know for me, I, I, I in my lifetime, I've always been the boss. And I know when I get these questions, I get a little bit of a stage fright. But that doesn't mean that if I don't have the answer that moment, that I'm not going to come back at the annual review time or at some other one-on-one -on -one and say, I've been thinking about what you asked and I came across this great article or I came across this training that we offer internally. I, it's so funny you should say that. We just got done in HR having a talk with managers about succession planning. Here's what I'm thinking. Here are some opportunities. Here are some things. So if you're not asking, if you're not telling, and if you're not asking, um, do. Start now. And don't be shy about it. It doesn't mean you're unhappy in your role. It doesn't mean you're going to perform less because you want to be over here doing something else. It just means that you're articulating effectively those things that they need to know in order to see where you see your future going. Once you see it, once you articulate it, and once they can see it, then you should be, everyone should be able to start visioning you as a different leader later in the organization or outside the organization, depending on who you're speaking with. So the other piece to this is following up and following through. Depending on your level of urgency, this can mean different things. But follow up with that manager. Have you had a chance to think about the things I can do to improve myself as a leader, to improve myself as um, someone that the the organization, and I say university because I work at the university, that the organization believes is someone they should promote or invest in. Keep asking those questions. It, you may not get the answer as quickly as you want, but it, you've planted the seed. It's in the back of people's minds, and they are thinking about it. The next piece in the goal step, and this is a foundational piece. This is where it kind of all begins is accountability. So the first piece of accountability, and I would have flipped these two bullets over. Um, we've given this presentation before, and one of my peers likes to use it second, but I believe owning your mistakes is the number one opportunity to demonstrate leadership or potential opportunity for growth to a current manager or other managers in lateral departments that provide input to your department or area or that you provide um, output into another area for. So owning those mistakes, catching them, going to the right people and saying, I made this mistake, I need to have this happen or I need to take it back so I can fix this or oh my bad, I learned something from this. Those are really important pieces of language to use. I know that within organizations, there is an apprehension in certain cultures to not own mistakes, but being authentic to the knowledge that you are better than that mistake will help you get through it. And it shows leadership. If you demonstrate that you can articulate you've made an error or someone else found an error and you step up and you go, oh my gosh, uh, yeah, I'm so sorry. I will go back and fix that or tell me what you'd like me to do to move forward. Those kinds of languages demonstrate to other people that you have leadership qualities. The other piece is not to work in a silo. Remember that there are inputs coming in to your area that affect you and the operation of your department, which is kind of the bigger more important piece and that you are providing outputs and your department is providing outputs that are important to someone else and if you see along that chain something that could improve something that's affecting the quality something that's affecting the ultimate customer satisfaction piece anywhere along in that chain you should be articulating it and talking about it 
You don't work in a silo. An organization is not a silo. We do tend to put people in categories or lateral um, functioning pieces of the organization. But if it becomes a silo, it becomes a detriment to the organization. And you be, start to actually sort of evolve that area into a less important area. So you want to keep your relationship with the departments that are giving you input and that you're sending output to. Um, you want to keep those lines dotted. You want to keep the communication flowing. And you want to make sure that you're demonstrating in your language and actions that you are seeing a bigger picture than just the process or work or piece of work that you do. If you're in sales, if you're in distribution, if you're in customer service, if you're in the accounting office, if you're in purchasing or, or procurement or sourcing, or if you are in some other area of the organization, remember that you know every pebble you drop in that organizational pool reverberates out and it's hitting other areas and other people and other work. And make sure you're looking at how that affects occurs and where the best opportunities for improvement are and articulate those things. This goes to initiatives. So we've talked about communication. We've talked about laying the groundwork and being accountable for communication. And once we're accountable and we start to see things happening, that's when we need to start taking initiative and we start looking for ways to lead. So I see a problem, it's affecting, it's caused by some input that's coming and it's affecting my output into this other department. I would like an opportunity to bring a cross-functional team of coworkers, peers on the front line together to fix this problem. That's a way to ask to lead. I would like an opportunity to plan the holiday Christmas party or the holiday gathering for the organization. That's an opportunity to lead. I would like to be on the diversity group. That's an active opportunity to lead. I'd like to be a part of the committee under a group I'm already involved with to be the chair of the committee that does this other this one piece. Those are all opportunities to lead. And if you're in a very, very small organization where there aren't different committees and cross-functional groups, look for ways to create some of that within your organization. Even if it's something as small as the appreciation picnic in May, or the employee family gathering, or the Thanksgiving dinner. Um, I laugh. I got I when I owned my own company years ago, and I forgot to mention this piece of my history. I, I owned a company, a, a chain of retail stores, and a distribution center for 18 years. Um, after that, I became a consultant for mostly nonprofit and association organizations. And then I evolved into this role. I did a lot of systems implementations. And so there's all these different weird pieces of my past that are completely separate careers that kind of make me uniquely qualified to talk about what we're discussing today. I went from a merchandise management degree out of MSU to running a chain of retail stores, which is completely exactly what my degree was, to doing association management, to doing systems implementations for MSU, to working at Davenport University in career services. So I guess you could say I'm no, I, I couldn't be farther from my degree at MSU, and I couldn't be closer to the level of experiences I've had across my incredibly long career <laughs> as as I as I am today. Um, and I wanna I wanna say that now because that initiative piece is a big piece of how I got where I was. Um, I'm not a person who sees a lot of boundaries, which can be good and bad. And I'm also kind of an advanced risk taker. Um, definitely informed risk taking, but definitely risk taking. And if I have to be the first guy over the cliff, I'm not afraid to do that. So that's where my initiative is sort of on steroids, where most people's initiative is guarded and careful and tactical. And that's great to be guarded and careful and tactical. But just make sure that when you see those opportunities, that you do take initiative. Um, I can tell you from experience, I have a lot of really great employees than I have had in the past. And sometimes they take initiative a lot. And sometimes they're constantly bringing up great ideas and ways to do things and ways to be better. And sometimes for a manager, that's overwhelming. And sometimes even good managers who want to see people grow like me 
have a tendency to want to shut them down and get the noise out of their head so they can do what needs to get done today. But that doesn't mean that as a manager, I don't think back on who can I ask about this? Who can I include in this conversation? Who can see a bigger picture? And who should I reach out to in my team that I can trust will look at this from a broad perspective and not from a protect my current job perspective? And I have those people on my team and I'm just about to promote one of them into a leading role that we created specifically for them because of this initiative piece. So that's been going on over the years and over the years um, in my role. And I appreciate those people when I suddenly have time to appreciate them. I don't not appreciate them when I don't have time, but I do think, oh boy, here we go. <laughs> I know where this is headed. I'm going to get a lot of input and I don't have a lot of time for it. But um, a good manager will articulate that. I see what you're saying. I understand where you are. I just have to get through this piece of the year. And then I'm sure we can talk about that. Or let's talk about it in smaller chunks. That's a bigger bite I can't take right now. And so when we go back to asking for feedback um, and taking accountability, when you take ignition initiative and you're getting the vibe that no one's buying your initiative or your ideas or your thoughts, Go back and ask for feedback. Go back and say, this seems like something that's kind of like nobody's buying into it. What do you think? Is it timing? Is it our workload? What's going on? Let them give you some feedback, but continue to stay in that positive initiative role where you're guiding where this goes. Um, don't be an it's my not my job kind of guy. Um, there are many, many times when we have to cross over and step into a department to our left or to our right or even underneath us in order to succeed for a season or through a crisis or in a situation like the busy season, right? Um, or because of things like COVID and stepping in and saying, it's not my job to learn all this technology so that I can do my job. It's your job to figure it out and teach me is not the right way to go. You want to be the guy on the committee creating the kinds of, of systems and processes and online services that make you able to do your job so that you're ahead of the curve and you can teach and train and coach others who are not comfortable in that area. So think about where you can step in to a situation and do something that's not your job. Um, again, see something, do something. Um, I. I I know that for a lot of people, seeing something and doing something without permission is a really big challenge. But sometimes you can see something and do something in a smaller scale and then demonstrate how it was successful or effective. And then it can become something that can be discussed and something that can be in incorporated and normalized and a part of processes and operations. So don't be afraid to see something and do something. Um, it's, it's a really valuable way to demonstrate initiative that we should all be considering. We're going to get to a part where we talk about resumes. And this is an area where when things work out, you want to go into your kind of catch-all resume, the one that captures everything, and you want to make a note that you did this, depending on whatever that initiative item was. So critical thinking and problem solving goes right back to taking initiative. So as you can see, all these five things stack on top of one another. All of these five things give us the opportunities and the next steps. So critical thinking, everybody sees problems, right? Everybody walks around the office saying, you know, the trouble is, the problem is, well, you know, we can't do that because this is a problem or this can't happen because this is a problem. Great. If you're not asking, so what's the solution? Or if you're not saying things like, I see that that's a problem. Here's a solution. Or I've done some research and other people in this industry, this is how they solve that. Or, you know, people don't even do this thing this way anymore. They're over here doing it this way and it solves that problem. Or if we just turn the nut one quarter turn to the right, that problem would be solved. So think about those things that people constantly talk about as problems. It could be um, something as 
as broad and sort of invasive as um, uh, corporate enthusiasm or, or corporate attitude. It could be something as along the lines of the insecurity of staff. So those are more HR and, and nerve wracking problems because they're pervasive usually due to a management issue. But it could be something like that, or it could be something as simple as we can't fulfill customer needs on their requests because of the simple thing that's going on that's a problem. It could be a person, it could be a process, it could be a system limitation, it could be a inventory flow situation, it could be a capacity situation. So you're always wanting to look at how capacity, how process flow, how systems operations flow works. And one of the things I always challenge my teams with, because I've done enough ERP and CRM systems implementations at the user level to know, if you as a user in your role are not fully maximizing the capabilities of your system, you are missing opportunity to solve problems. I can't tell you how many, when I first came into this role at Davenport, the job posting and job system that we had, I went around to every single employee at the time and I said, tell me about how you use the system. Tell me how it works. And I can't tell you how many people said to me, honestly, I, I don't really know how this works. I just do these things and that's all I do with the system. Well, needless to say, in my first year, we fired that ERP system because they couldn't seem to provide us with the kind of insights and training we needed um, at a reasonable cost to keep us as a user. So we went on to a new system. And at that time, I said, now, we've got this system. We are all at the same level of training. We are all at the same level of comprehension and understanding. It is incumbent on you to continue to understand and exploit this system. Systems don't just work on their own. They work because people understand how to use them and do it. And we are now five systems later in the 13 years I've been here due to the evolution of the industry and opportunities. And I continue to say those things to people. And, it, and our exploitation of our system continues to make us relevant. So when you're thinking about in your roles, what systems and ERP and, and CRM systems you're using, if you're not at some level actively engaging in trying to improve your knowledge and understand how to exploit just even that, you're not using your critical thinking skills to their fullest in your current role. And when you start doing that, you're going to start seeing leadership opportunities, Le opportunities to help your peers, opportunities to see crossover into other departments and opportunities to grow. Um, and I can tell you right now, the person I'm promoting this week did that and, and to the max, to the point where other departments are actively using regularly our, our little CRM and making its value more spread across more departments. So feel that empowerment. Give yourself the, 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 the right to make good problem solving decisions and articulate them to others. And then the continuing education piece, which lo and behold, Self-learning through understanding your operating systems and things like that and reviewing videos from them is a piece of that. But as we all know that our, our current careers, of course, it was it's very obvious in the technology industry, but it's obvious in accounting, it's obvious in HR, it's ob obvious in procurement and in sourcing, it's obvious in distribution and international distribution. It's obvious in any role that has regulations from the government guiding it or any of those sorts of things um, that we must continue to keep up on our education. And currently, as we're keeping up in our education, we want to make sure that we are staying relevant to current um, changes in the industry as well as changes in our specific roles internally and externally to our industry. So our trade associations are great opportunities for this. Um, even things as simple as just getting else Excel down, um, getting more advanced in the way that you use the Microsoft suites um, of products, 
getting yourself more advanced on internal systems, processes, and operations, getting more advanced on what's coming um, down the pipe, understanding industry regulations and government regulations better. All of those things make you more valuable and give you a broader view of how you're going to bring value and execute more efficiently and effectively in your current role and make you visible for future roles. So I just want to pause there because the next thing we're going to talk about is resumes. And I wonder if anyone has any thoughts, questions, or insights um, into keeping your network working for you, the five key things to taking charge of your success. Those, I don't want to move too quickly, and I will go back to these because I do have some stories to tell um, about some of these things, um, especially the owning your responsibilities and roles. I can share with you, I had an employee once who applied for two different promotions. They didn't get either of them, and they were really, really, um, they were really thunderstruck by it. It really harmed their, their perspective on the organization and their perspective on themselves. Oh, thank you, Whitney. Yeah, please chat the questions. Um, and I tried to softly explain why they weren't being seen as that next level leader over other people in the organization who did get those promotions. And it didn't go well. We ended up endeavoring into evaluating a new system for our students called Pathway U, which by the way, all of you have access to. And it's kind of like the strong interest inventory in that it measures your interests and applies them to industries and careers within industries. But it does more. It's, it does interest, interests, it does values, and um, another area, and I'm, I'm not thinking of it at the moment, but it, it evaluates three different areas. And then it automatically gives you feedback. So before we chose to go with Pathway U, I had my entire staff take the surveys and I had them read their evaluations. And this particular person said, oh my gosh, she called, she called me and said, do you have a minute? And I said, of course. And she said, I just read my evaluation from Pathway U. She said, I was so mad, I shut the computer and walked away. And then I thought about all the reasons that I may not have been promoted into the jobs that I was looking for. And I went back and I reread the evaluation through Pathway U. And I learned so much. I didn't like all the things that I learned, but I learned so much. And I said, well, that's great. Are you ready to take some responsibility in a different area and maybe use some of those skills? And she said, yes. And I happened to have something that I wanted to be, I wanted to give away to somebody that made them more, gave them a specialized area. And I knew they had the skills for it, but I needed them to ask for it and take that risk again. I didn't want to just hand it to them because there were other people who also want more responsibility in my group. And I wanted to make sure that the person asking was the person who got, going back to communicating, and she asked for it and now is taking on a very big piece of my role um, and doing it very successfully. But, it, you know, think about that continuing education piece. That includes self-learning. That includes improving the current skills you have to make your current role better. And that includes expanding your skills into the areas that you feel um, you're interested in going, gaining that knowledge. So I look around Davenport University and I wonder what's next for me? Where could I go? I love data. I love analytics. I love systems. So in Institutional research is an option for me. Another area is the Entrepreneur Center. I've been a business owner. I am a business owner. I love that piece. I teach entrepreneurship for junior achievement. I could go over to the Entrepreneurial Center and the experiential learning side. There's a lot of areas as I look around the university that aren't obvious, but they're pretty cool. And they are maybe opportunity in the future as I'm talking to people that might lead me there out of the role I'm in now. Not that I don't love this role, but where I can bring the most value at the time the university needs it is where I want to be. And I think we all need to think that way. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Now let's go on to the resume piece. This is just kind of a rule of thumb piece that everyone should be aware of. Now, depending on your level of advancement, 
in your career right now or in the career that you just left and are going to a new career if 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 you have a lot of relevant experience a two-page resume is acceptable i mean when i look back at my career i have like 30 plus years of experience right so as a leader not just as an employee working in an hourly job or as a supervisor but literally as an organizational leader so for me to have less than a two-page resume for any role i might aspire to might be too little but that depends on the role and it depends on what i have to say about it and how concisely i can say it so i always have people do this one thing for me i always have people take a piece of letter paper letterhead paper and fold it in thirds and then open it back up when you look at that letterhead paper and you think about the top of your resume and any role you might aim for the most important things you have to say about yourself as it relates to that role essentially belong in that top third of your resume whether it's just clearly stating that you want this job with this company because of these reasons and these skills that you have or whether it's literally that you are stacking your related skills or your key successes in this area in that top area the goal of a resume is to get an, a hiring manager like me to read yes 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 in that very first third or um of the paper or a half of of the document so when you think about your resume as an advertisement your resume as that billboard that hiring managers are seeing as they drive 80 miles an hour down the highway and they happen to glance up and see a billboard what in that first third is going to catch their attention and tell them that you are the man for this job or the woman for this job or the person for this job that's the key so when i tell people to construct their resumes to give that yes notion and that puts you in the yes pile that gets you the interview that's what i'm talking about as i read if there's an objective on the resume if that objective isn't specific to me my role my organization and what i'm looking for i get the impression that this person has just done the shotgun approach and they've sprayed a bunch of resumes out there and they're hoping so okay maybe they're not really after this job but they're after a job if within that first third i don't see something that indicates to me that they're pointing at that particular role then i have to search how much time am i going to search if i'm not seeing yes at the very top of the resume in my mind if i'm not seeing yes in the very next lines if i'm not seeing yes in the very first bullets under each experience or each piece of education that they are highlighting am i going to dig when i have hundreds of other resumes to go through and yes surprisingly many organizations actually do read resumes um, I know the federal government actually reads resumes. Um, healthcare has recruiters that actually vet the resumes before they go on to their hiring managers. A lot of organizations do it that way. Anybody that has the position recruiter, those people are reading the resumes. Um, so think about that. Another way to get very embedded is to utilize some of the language that's in the job description specifically to help describe what you do so that it reads authentically to the hiring manager if they use a specific terminology but your industry uses a different terminology or your company does but it's the same thing use the terminology in the job description and fortify it with data facts quantities qualities that make it clear that you do this well you do this this much you do this this often you do this this effectively so think about those things in your resume how can you construct those bullets so that they read so that a hiring manager can identify you as someone who gets it who understands who actually knows who truly wants that's 
kind of the key in the art of constructing. Of course, all, red, all resumes need a decent header with contact information, a profile or objective. The profile can be those skills that are sought after in the position you're applying for. The objective can relate to the position within the organization that you're aiming for and why. Um, the key skills are truly those key skills that you possess that make you a qualified candidate, not just your generally good key skills like good communicator, unless top of the list of goals is to have someone as a good communicator in that role. Professional experience is always good, even if it's gig. If you're a younger person watching this, if you've done gig stuff outside of what you do in your current role, that relates. If you do something on the side that, that's relative, that relates. I do this, but I've been doing this on the side and I really love it and I wanna make it my career, go for it and articulate that. Education and extended um, learning, very important. Very, very important. And then again, community involvement. I, I always get a chuckle out of my accounting students, especially who don't understand that in their role, especially in, uh, in CPA firms or large accounting firms, a lot of what they're doing is recruiting clients and they're measured on that and you don't become a partner unless you do bring good clients in. Uh, very different from corporate accounting, right? But if they're not able to show um, involvement in the community, they're probably uh, not going to be as sought after as that person who can become embedded in the community and grow their, um, their cash of, um, of external um, involvement and awareness. And two words have escaped me now since this began, but I'll come up with them. But anyway, the involvement in the community is elemental, especially for organizations that are um, not just being good community neighbors because the majority of their business is done outside of the community in which their office resides, but in organizations where, you know, the regional amount of business that they do is, is their business and is where they lead. So industry matters. Um, we talk about the one page resume. Federal resumes can be as long as you want them to be. They are always chronological and they always include both paid and unpaid or volunteer positions in chronological order. So think about that. They also aren't bullet pointed. They're written in paragraph form. They are your writing sample. Academic and nonprofit resumes can be longer if a CV is requested. Um, so think about that. You know, a vitae is a different animal than a resume, uh, but it's not that hard to translate your resume into a vitae. Um, and then private industry, uh, we, you know, as private industry folks, we don't have time. Just send us the key points, let us see from there, and let's go from there. That's kind of the attitude, if you will, of um, how people review resumes. There are a lot of really good, by the way, um, seminars from the federal government on how to write a federal resume. And if anybody's interested in that, I'll hunt those down and email them to you. Let me change slides here. So we've got this cache of communicating our needs and our being accountable and taking initiative and being a critical thinker and continuing our education. And we have demonstrated ways on this giant document called our, our um, draft resume that has every single thing we could ever imagine on it that we can pull off and push into a resume. And now we've crafted that resume for the position that we're aiming for. And every single time we aim for a different position, we need to do a little crafting. So think about that. Um, and because we did that great job crafting our resume, now we got the interview. So what? How do we execute the interview process effectively? Um, especially now in this era of um, in this era of um, online interviewing and online um, electronic everything. So I want you to think about that. Um, so we'll talk about that in a minute. But one of the things that we want to start with is remembering that it is our resume that got us through the door. So one of the key things we want to do is stick to the points that got us through the door and 
be able to tell stories about those points in an interview. So we're not going to go off on some tangent about how we coach after school and we love kids. And, you know, by the way, in this in this role, will I be able to leave at three o'clock, you know, two and a half days a week every, every day in the spring because softball's coming. You know, think about that. We, we want to stick with what got us in the door and we want to be able to tell stories about each of those bullet points. And so bringing in with you in that interview or taking or having in front of you in an online setting that document with some notes about some stories that you can tell that that expand on that idea of how much, how often, how well, you know, how successfully, how um, embedded, how good, how many, all that. We need to be able to tell those stories um, when we're asked the questions. Um, so think about how you got there. Was it through networking? Do you need to reference anybody? Do you need to thank anybody? Do you need to um, restate that? Or did you apply blindly and it was the notes on your resume that got you in the door? And was it your follow-up and your tenacity and asking, when will I hear? May I have an interview? Thank you for your time. All of those kinds of things that you do after you send your resume in and you follow up to make sure they received it. And then you follow up to find out, you know, when will you be making a decision? And, um, you know, if I'm at selected for an interview, when can I expect to hear from that? Is there anything else you need? Those kinds of things. Show again how you're going to fulfill their needs. So I always say it's about skill, ability, education, and experience. It isn't any one thing that keeps you. So we often do apply for jobs where we may not have every piece of what they're asking for in the job description, the way that they're asking, but we have lots of pieces. And we know because we're smart that we'll learn the rest of it. Or we can YouTube video that and we can talk about that. I took the initiative to just, you know, train myself in that area, even though I don't have direct experience in that area. Those are things you can do. When you're asked a question, you really want to give the best star answers that you can give, which means that if you're getting a behavioral question or explain to me how you accomplish this goal, which is more of a um, outcome based question you want to be able to give the situation the task the action and the results so i'll give you an example um we had at my company back when i owned it a really bad cash flow problem people weren't paying their bills and we didn't have cash in an extreme level i mean we were we were our aging was 95 days or older closer to 120 days which is unthinkable when you're thinking you really want your cat your aging to be within 45 days or less and 30 days if you can right so our aging was in a terrible situation and instead of calling up the people who owed us money and saying you know pay your darn bill pay or else we're going to send you to collections one of our people in customer service said, well, on my end, what I'm seeing is a lot of our orders are going out incomplete and a lot of our customers won't pay for an order until it's complete. To the extent that, for example, the Virgin Islands owed us almost $200,000, but there were enough orders with back orders or that they hadn't fully received in their warehouse that it was an issue. And part of it was because of discontinued items that we didn't discontinue off of the order. Um, and so they still viewed the order as incomplete. They were waiting for us to find a replacement. So all this crazy stuff was happening. So we decided that, all right, what we need to do is we need to call and we need to mail every single person who hasn't paid their bill. And we need to ask them, is there something happening with your order that's keeping you from paying this bill? And we learned an immense amount of information and in, within a week, in a very short period of time, which led us to something we never imagined would happen. We had to restructure our entire warehouse and we had to have a line on every order out in the warehouse. If it was a customer who would only pay complete orders and an item was back ordered, that we would mark the order complete at the time of billing so that it would get paid. And so, this issue in our receivables department became an issue for our customer service department, which they helped solve. Our fulfillment, our fillers, and our warehouse layout and design and product um, when we receive our receiving and where things went in the warehouse, it became an issue for um, our accounts 
um, our billing department and it became an issue for our purchasing department and together we all got together and we solved this issue and we got our aging down I think it was in something like 60 days down under um, 45 days and closer to 30 days so that's what I mean if someone's asking you tell me about a time when you saw a problem and effectively solved it that would be one I would bring up in an interview. And it's on my resume, you know, in, 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 inventory and in, in inventory and customer service are on my resume, but it ties those pieces together. So I want you to think about that. When you look at the bullets on your resume and the job that you're applying for, what would you say if they asked you that question? Or tell me about a time when you had a difficult coworker, or tell me when you a, about a time when you coached a peer, or tell me about a time when something in the industry blew up and you saw that issue. So think about those things and how you would answer these with a situation. Here's the situation, here was the task, here were the actions we took, and these were the results. And can you do that in you know a minute or two so that you can get on to the rest of the interview? Think about those things because those are elemental to the quality of interview. And they definitely demonstrate you showing an interest and an active engagement in your current and future roles. So think about that. So we are at 47 minutes and um, I wanna make sure that people have a chance to ask questions and that we have time to answer them. One of the things that we have um, that might also initiate some questions is this reference slide, which all of you are going to receive the slide deck when this is over. And these links are really essential to helping you utilize the resources that are still available to you through Davenport. As you know, we provide lifelong career services and coaching, and we're here. And when Whitney had mentioned earlier in this webinar uh, that we see, saw over 200 people this year, alumni, that's just this year alone. We see an average of 200 um, of 200 um, alumni annually. Um, I see a question, what recommendations do you have when it comes to design elements on resumes? Is it better to stick to the standard layout or adding some flair? That's an awesome question and it comes down to two things. One, if you're a marketing and, and person, <laughs> you definitely want to show some creativity in the marketing realm. So right there is probably an answer for that one. But two, one of the reasons that I frown on utilizing a template that has a lot of really cool elements to it is that ability to adjust your resume effectively. So whatever document you do create, you need to own all of the elements of the document yourself and not have it be something that's kind of trapped in a template format that's difficult for you personally to change. And I, I say this because it's it's really important for you to be able to update your resume as a new and living document. So if I were to show you my draft resume document, you would look at it and go, oh my gosh, nobody would ever read this and nobody would ever hire you. I have one document that's probably truly one of the ugliest things you've ever seen, but it's broken up by category where I have expertise, which is human resources, systems, marketing, leadership and management, and organizational change and development. And so I have this really awful document that I pull out and plug into prettier documents that are more relevant to specific roles. And I guess that's the best way I can describe it. As long as you own it, and as long as you also recognize that the person who's reading this has to find information easily and quickly, it can't be so chock full of data and information that it's impossible to read. So no less than 11 font, give yourself space and room. If you have to make it two pages, make it two pages. Make it appealing, it is a marketing piece, even if you're not a marketing person. So keep that in mind. I have a full plate of work. What are some simple ways to show initiative that would get me recognized? Um, some simple ways would be helping your peers in your department. That would be the first thing. You know, it, at your full plate, but your full plate might be full because other people may or may not be um, 
as advanced in their roles as you are in yours. And if you can help bring them along and you can help them take on pieces of the role that make your piece feel heavy, the parts you don't like, but they might like. Um, I'll give you an example. My daughter is applying for a new role in the bank she works in. And the, the role is specifically in a specific area that she loves and nobody else likes doing it. But it's something they all currently have to do. And they were all teasing her in a team meeting like, oh, please apply for this role. None of us like to do this. You've got you've got this, you know, that kind of thing. If you can help take the weight off from somebody or help them gain some industry or strength or specialization through distributing your rollout within your department or distributing work out differently within your department, that's ways to show initiative. Um, we're constantly looking at student loads and we have a, um, a student load of about 750 students per coach, but we're always rearranging those loads to make sure because some students are higher touch than others, that it's actually equitable. So some people might actually only have a customer load of 600 and some might have 830 students but their actual workloads are balanced because of the way those students utilize us. So I think about it in those ways, like how can we make this work not overwhelming for everyone and do better at it and provide better outcomes because of it? Does that make sense? I hope. How do you assess workplace culture in an interview? Oh gosh, those those cultural interview questions are key. When When it gets to the point um, first of all, you can see whether it's hierarchy or not by the way that they structure the interviews, especially if it's a panel or a group interview. Lots of times one person will ask the questions and it may not be the lead person. It might be the lead person's just sitting back watching or you have a control freak who just wants to ask all the questions and eventually they're going to get around to asking the other two people what they thought. So think about that. How is the interview structured? And definitely, definitely, definitely when you get to that end where they ask if you have any questions, you might say, I have some functional questions and I have some cultural questions and I'd like to start with the cultural question. Tell me about what makes you want to stay with this organization? What do you love about it? Tell me about um, how, how this, or you might say, I've done some research and I noticed that um, other businesses in your industry do or don't do these certain things. Can you explain why that's not a value or a function of the organization on the whole? Some people have diversity and equity and inclusion programs. Some people have um, employee benefits that are better than others. You know, you, you might be general about that, but just ask. I noticed in your industry, there are all these different kinds of ways organizations engage culturally. Can you describe what the theories are, what the tactics are behind the organizational culture you portray. Um, functional would be describe a day in this role, describe a day in your role. Um, how do you manage? How do, if you're talking to the direct supervisor in your role, how do you lead? How do you like to manage? Um, how do you like to be communicated with? Those are all things that will give you really good ideas about what that organization is, and I'm glad you asked that question because interviews are not just you trying to be amazing to them. They are also trying to be amazing to you and you want to give them that chance. Um, what, oh, that makes sense, thank you. Um, virtual interviews, I don't know if you can see my background, but you can see my face. I'm not a shadow. Um, I'm at eye level or a little bit, you know, if you're up a little bit, that's good, but you don't want anyone looking up your nose. So you want to make sure that, you know, you're visually, your background is pleasing. Um, you guys, unless I move, you can't see that there's a doorway right there and that people might be moving back and forth in that area. You want to make sure that you are in a space where you're not moving back. You know, you can't see activity going on. My dog is outside. My phone is off. Um, so there's nothing going on that can distract from you and I talking. Um, the background I think is pleasing. There's a little bit of artwork. So if I'm boring you, you can look at art. Um, but that's kind of the thing you want to watch for is you want to make sure that they can see you, that you're professionally dressed, that you're well-groomed, 
um, and that you are expressing the way you might in an individual one-on-one -on -one conversation with your hands or with your eyes without flailing, without knocking your water over, that kind of thing. Um, you can always have your portfolio in front of you and you can look up and down. It's okay to let them see you reviewing your notes and, and making sure that you get it right. That's fine. But you just want to make sure that nothing is going on back here or in front of you that's going to distract them from wanting to communicate with you. The other thing I have to share, and then I'll, I'll let you go, practice this. I don't know if you noticed, I did forget two words that I couldn't find in my brain, but that might be because I'm 100 years old. But you do want to practice your language. You don't want to sound like you're guessing at answers in an interview. You want to make sure that from the moment that you start talking, it's authentic to you and that it sounds that way. So I know we don't like to talk to ourselves and hear our voices, but if you're not that guy or gal or person who grew up with the pen or the hairbrush or the curling iron microwave in your hand or uh, microphone in your hand in front of the mirror while you were getting ready in the morning, singing and talking and being great, make sure that you do it. Make sure you practice and hear your voice and talk about out loud so that you believe what you're saying and it's authentic to you every chance you get. And the best time is in the car because nobody knows you're not um, you're not Bluetoothing it and just talking on the phone and nobody will think you're crazy for talking to yourself. That's all. I hope you all have a great day. Well, thank you so much, Shelly. Um, I hope everyone found a lot of value in the things that Shelly was presenting. As she had mentioned, this is recorded, so we will send that out, but we will also send the slide deck out. This last one we have it on right now has a ton of great information. Um, I know, Shelly, you and I have talked about your use of Handshake, and there are jobs that are posted there on Handshake if you are in the market. Um, get in contact with Shelly. We'll make sure that you have all of that information. Um, and just before we all sign off, I wanted to let you guys know that we have our next Davenport Dialogue series episode, and this will be on a successful start to your college search. So if you have a high school student in your life that is looking at colleges and not quite sure what to look for or what the steps are, that'll be on February 23rd, and we will send the registration information in our follow-up email along with this recording and the slide decks. So thank you all, and Shelly dropped uh, the handshake link into the chat. Thank you all. Thank you, Shelly, and everyone have a great afternoon. Thanks. Bye.